So good morning, Spark Summit. Um, I'm Matt from Hotels.com. I want to share a little bit of our journey and some of the highlights and the, uh, the pitfalls we've had, and hopefully this will help you in your own journeys uh, going forwards. So a little bit of HCOM, we're part of the Expedia Group, and in particular the home of Captain Obvious. Um, big global business, operating in many countries across many languages. Um, millions of customers, and that drives obviously, huge amounts of data uh, and a lot of uh, very interesting algorithmic and machine learning use cases. Fundamentally, we're trying to become an algorithmic business to improve the experiences for our customers and to find the right customers in different marketplaces. And I think about 18 months ago, it felt a little bit like this. There was data piling up everywhere. We had a, an on-premise Hadoop cluster in our data center. We were using SQL and SAS to do our data science and algorithms and stats. And in 18 months, we've completely changed that view. We've gone 100% into the cloud and used the agility and the flexibility that our cloud is, is, and in particular the Amazon Cloud has brought us. We've reinvigorated our applications. Um, and in particular, we've moved to using Spark as 100% of our workflows. And that's been a huge boost both for our business and for our customers. And ultimately, we, we've taken, I think, the starting baby steps. And I'm quite proud, I think, to say we've maybe moved out of baby steps. I think we're now in the toddler phase. Uh, I'll let you take your own view around my fashion sense, if it's improved or not. But the, um, the, uh, I think the crucial thing is, is that this is the golden age of machine learning data science. I'm incredibly excited to be part of it. Um, and the wider community that's working on this. But in particular, the one extra point I wanted to make is it feels like we're on the frontier an awful lot. The pathway is unclear. Where we go from here often doesn't exist or the technology is immature, and it's usually quite hard. And it's really important, I think, and one thing is the cloud has really brought us, and some of the technology, for example, like Spark, is that you can actually, it's really important to be fast. Being right is kind of handy and uh, you know, often, often essential, but being fast is absolutely crucial. You know, in, if you think about in, in some of the previous world, we could usually do about two or three application or platform or tool uh, evaluations a year. If you're doing that, the speed that you can go at is driven by how fast you can do due diligence, and you put a lot of personal credibility in that choice. That slows innovation and slows the pace you can get at these things. Going forwards um, with the cloud, we now do 40 to 50 per year in, li in little over 18 months. That changes the conversation. It's a little bit like data science becoming closer to more like A-B testing and engineering, experimentation. It's no longer personal credibility at stake. People can take bigger risks, and that really has transformed what we do and how we do things. But it's really about people as well. It's a great tech conference, but never forget about the people. Cross-functional teams are crucial. We work in a cross-functional pod structure. And um, we like group hugs. But fundamentally, I think, you know, I use data science as a little yappy dog on top of the big shy horse of engineering. Um, and it's really important that everyone works together. It's architecture, data engineering, software engineering, DevOps, forming that cross-functional team. In particular, we brought all those disciplines together as one function. And that's been a key part of our success, and I recommend that model, if it works in your business, to take a look at it. The other crucial thing I'd say is having support from the very top. So from our chairman, the CEO, my boss, the president of the brand, um, here's a particular quote, around artificial intelligence will be travel's next best thing. And our CEO on our last earnings call with Wall Street talked about three disruptive technologies. Mobile, over half our traffic is now mobile and that's happened in the last four to five years. Messaging, and this is one of the crucial things where as NLP has grown, you know, a lot of data science and stats is all about trying to second guess people, learn patterns. But if you ask people what they want, that's surely a better world and a much better real-time signal that streaming can take advantage of. And that's a really exciting world. And of course, machine learning, I think is a crucial value, and hopefully you'll see some use cases in a second. And it's really about how do we turn the screen around. 20 years ago, 
We innovated by making price transparent to customers, making it easier to book. Now we can actually help customers to make the right choice, improve advice, and really try to create almost the next revolution in online travel uh, on the back of this. Moving on to our platform a little bit, this is a, a bit of a, a top level conceptual architecture. You can see just across the top there, we have a streaming, our own technology to stream data from the live site or from marketing, Google, MetaSearch, wherever it is, through into S3, across into the right-hand side, which is where sort of my world really kicks in. We collect the data, both real-time and in batch. We process it in the training world, which I'm gonna show you in the next slide. And our big challenge, I think, this year, I'm very excited, is how we build into more real-time scoring. We have some of this uh, already, but I think this is our next big revolution on how to become more efficient at deploying models into production. And sorry, and Athena is our multivariate testing tool. Those two have to work together and moving to things like real-time bandits, you heard a little bit of that yesterday, is really crucial. So really we have two major platforms. We make extensive use of the Databricks platform, the unified platform, um, talking about on the next slide. We also have a backup called Maestro, which picks up some of the elements that we can't do in Databricks right now. And I think I'm very excited by Matei's and Ali's announcements this morning are gonna help me uh, become more efficient in this space going forwards. We're also experimenting with Google, um, particularly the TensorFlow capability in Google. That may all change, but it's a very exciting way going forwards right now. Um, so just moving to Databricks itself, this has been a real revolution for us. The thing for me, as I said earlier, is it's kind of quite hard to do data science. And I wanna be easy. I want my data scientists looking at data, looking at algorithms, helping customers figuring out the best algorithm for a customer, not trying to make tech work. Um, and one of the things that Databricks has really helped us to do is make that a really easy, flexible, and productive world. We, we, when we tried it, when um, it was moved across to Databricks, one of my teams said to me, hey, Matt, you know, this is the first time technology has really worked and has transformed my life. And that was a natural quote from somebody on my team. So it's been a huge value to us, both driving up productivity and flexibility, and the life cycle, um, we move much faster. In particular, it's also secure and reliable, which is really crucial in enterprises, uh, particularly in this world. And the final thing I was gonna say, this is a real chart. Um, this is why I tend to call it extreme elasticity. So this is the actual server usage by our period. Um, so you've got the top there, 550 boxes. Um, and it shows that you can leverage huge amounts of compute when you need it and spin it back down. And particularly, you can use cost-effective spot instances, which are about 10 to 20% of, of the cost of a full box. That's been really powerful for keeping our costs down, but keeping the reliability up. As I mentioned earlier, deploying algorithms is crucial to us. So as you can see there, we have this thing called the Algorithmic uh, Lifecycle Pipeline Service, or ALPS. It's great to have a good analogy for any product range. And this is one of my big 2017 initiatives on how to become much more efficient at real-time scoring and serialization of models. And you can see this, this is, we're doing a POC with all these players right now to try and figure out what's the best player. And I will come back at some point, hopefully, and share uh, which was the winner. I guess the crucial piece going forwards is that there isn't always one winner. It's much more about actually having a suite of evolving technology. You haven't got to be right, don't forget, you've got to be fast. Being right helps. So onto a couple of use cases. Um, this sort of thing has a great link, and I'm very pleased Databricks have announced their deep learning pipeline and the Spark community. That's because we've been building this ourselves, so that's quite a great announcement. But fundamentally, customers, after price and location, and what's in the hotel, the photo images are the next most important thing to them. So we have three big use cases for the image world around data science, machine learning, and deep learning. We have a lot of photos which sometimes look like duplicates, or near duplicates in particular. How do we understand what the photo really means? We have millions of photos from hotels. We also have hundreds of thousands of photos and growing fast by the day from our customers. You know, that really helps to grow authenticity of what the experience will be like. And also, how do we rank them? If you're on a mobile phone, and don't forget half our customers are, or over half and growing, then you've got to cycle through each photo using bandwidth, and that's a really crucial thing, I get that order right. 
sometimes we have great success. Uh, there's a lovely hotel uh, out in the Bahamas. On the right-hand side, that side, um, sometimes not so much success. Uh, and you talked about with the snorkel project yesterday that Martin mentioned um, and Chris mentioned, sometimes users and annotated data struggles. So that was somebody's bathroom that they tagged. Um, and that's some of the challenges you face in the real world in this space. The other thing we've um, been experimenting with is using GPUs. Um, this has been really hard. It has been open. Um, many use <coughs> Keras and TensorFlow. And it's been really tough to get this to scale. So you can see on the left-hand side, we tried some CPUs. We tried one GPU. You know, 67 days to, to train one model isn't in the game. That's not going to work. And, the, and the, the data at the top actually is estimated. Clearly, we didn't wait 67 days to find that data out. Um, now, the eagle-eyed amongst you, you may have noticed, on the right-hand side, you've got four days for a 16 GPU world and 15 days at the bottom. So something we found, A, we're moving from one GPU to 16 GPUs, i.e. 16 times the cost, we only got about a two and a bit times improvement in speed. That's not great. And we went really into the depths of the software engineering of this and discovered how to optimize it. We were starving the CPU. The CPU was starving the GPU inside the box. Disk was starving the GPUs. We solved all those issues. And I thought, great, we're going to have four lasers getting there. And it was 15. You're like, OK. And eventually, with a lot more work, we managed to get down to two and a half days. Um, the interesting thing is then when we flipped from, say, reception, from reception V3 to ResNet, if you heard the um, demo yesterday, that took us three and a half weeks to build that. When the demo yesterday was, what, a minute? So very excited for where this is going to take this world uh, going forwards. But particularly, it kind of works. So our model is about 99.97% accurate now uh, with a lot of hard work. And you can see on the left-hand side there, those aren't duplicates. And the model got it right, which is great. On the right-hand side, they are near duplicates. The, the image on the top right actually is a slightly different bus that was photoshopped in uh, at one point. On the bottom there, the curtain's been opened and closed. But as the open and, open and closes, that's probably not added value to the user. Um, and we can help to kind of re-optimize what we do. We can get some of the categorizations right. So these are real examples of what the model said the categorization was. And that's our confusion matrix. So just to navigate this, the darker the blue, the better, the more accurate the match. Um, so pretty much, we were pretty happy. A couple of use cases we're still working on. But we're very happy we're now we're getting some really good accuracy and low confusion. And fundamentally, we're trying to optimize the order. So this is a hotel in London. And you can see there, um, this is what the, order, the, the, the algorithm said the better order was. The best thing about this, though, is we can now build feedback loops to mesh deep learning with behavioral feedback loops and, and click behaviors and custom behaviors in Spark. We can slam those together to actually find the best hotel order for you as each, each individual customer. So this isn't about a giant average. I can find it for different users, different use cases. I can find the right hotel and the right photo order for you. So we think this is going to be a huge value to our customers going forwards. The other use case I wanted to mention is our kind of core bread and butter. The reason we exist, partly, is to find the right hotel for you at the best price. Um, on the left there is our desktop view. On the right there is our mobile view, in particular things like secret prices and various other initiatives. Um, make it crucial to find the best order for you. We have thousands of hotels and vacation rental properties in each market. Uh, you, of course, only need one of them. And one of the crucial things is geography. So we use Databricks extensively to help us with solve this problem in Spark. So one user segment, for example, in London, likes to stay there as a heat map. Another user segment likes to stay there. So quite a bit more now towards Canary Wharf, where the big city center is. These customers you know, tend to stay in the main touristy areas of London. And these customers tend to have a big hotspot you can see near Heathrow. So by understanding these different trends of customers, particularly where people want to stay, find the, the best hotel for you. And in particular, it's all about bringing together not just the final purchase, the booking, but also intent, various different types of intent. Much more now looking at streaming to help us get there faster but also things that customers are just browsing. A you know, typical customer will do between four and nine searches on our site. 
So I haven't got to be right once, I have to be right nine times in a row. Um, and that's really crucial to have uh, the power. Um, you know, our training data is now over five terabytes big, uh, and we have to run that incredible speed, and particularly to then power personalization. So hopefully, I've shared a couple of uh, interesting use cases we're playing with, and some of our uh, uh, platforms, some of the things we found that have been good, some of our challenges, and hopefully you have a great rest of your uh, Spark Summit conference. Thank you for your time.